and now you're probably going to see me over the podium. <laughs> but um, so in the Hudson District, we have really um, set some high expectations for what we hope to do in education, and a lot of those really bold goals that we have set, like eliminating racial disparities, uh, being a number one choice for families, being a number one choice for teachers to come and teach at. Um, require us to think about education in a different way um, and less um, of a way where we are um, kind of that standardized way. Um, just like if you think of the old fashioned model and what a lot of even me uh, experienced as a child wanting to be teacher. Because frankly, the world that we're preparing kids for is, is unknown. Um, it's a little ambiguous right now, but we do know the things that we need um, students or um, humans mm -hmm. to be able to do in the future have to be able to be creative and innovative, think critically, um, find solutions to problems that really don't even know. So at Meadowbrook, we talked about how things are changing and um, that should happen in our classrooms. Um, and so Is this this testing testing no nope. Testing, testing, why is there nothing coming in? Testing, testing, testing. no, why? I can't figure out why the audio is not still. Oh, there. Testing, testing, how's that sounding now? Carissa, can you hear us? Okay, okay, we'll go with it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the hardest part of today. <laughs> um, yes, so everything that Natalie said and everything that I said, so I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much. And as Betty said, um, uh, my husband and, and I were Golden Valley residents, but I also um, have graduated from Hopkins and moved to, uh, got a job at Meadowbrook and loved it. And that's where our children will go. And two years ago, a role came up and I interviewed for it and it became thought it was more one way and Natalie said it was more project-based learning which I had no clue what that was and so I did a huge deep dive that summer into lots of books and learning um, and so I'm going to try to give a, a kind of a snippet of what that is and what we're doing at Meadowbrook um, for project-based learning. Okay so uh, Project-based learning, or as I might refer to it as PBL, is a teaching method in which students learn by actively engaging in real-world and personally meaningful projects. And the, the focus of that is that we want to make sure that it's not just something it's it's Charlie Brown's teacher in the front of the room, you know, mur, 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 mur. it's something engaging to them. They want to be learning. It's authentic to them. And this image is sort of what project-based learning is versus that traditional learning. For that traditional learning is there's a project at the end, which is the dessert. You learn all these things, now show us in some sort of project, and it's all going to be sort of the same. It's cookie cutter, it's right there. But project-based learning, PBL, is the main course. They are learning, and while they are learning, they are working on project. this project, this cumulative thing that they are going to then 
learn from it and eventually showcase. And I'll show you some ideas of what that means with the kind of that main course. So at Meadowbrook, we introduced this last year and we started, started a little slow to you know, go smooth. And so a lot of teachers started creating wonder walls or wonder posters and a wonder Wednesday. And they asked their students what they were curious about, what they were wondering. And these are three examples, um, two from third grade and one from our multi-age first and second grade classroom. And it's hard to see, but there are questions on here. Someone's asking, where's the equator? What was the first game? Um, the one, two ones are pretty like, how was salt made? I mean, there's just little questions like that that kids are curious about. And we wanna create that curiosity from kindergarten to sixth grade and on because a lot of students, they have that curiosity. They ask those questions when they're younger. And then as they get into elementary age and elementary school, those questions kind of died down because things are just given to them versus what do you wanna learn as, and I'm the teacher, I will help you learn those things. So this is another example of a wonder wall in a kindergarten classroom. And this kindergarten teacher, she asked them all what they were curious about. And then throughout the whole year, they would answer all these questions, either through reading stories, finding videos, um, potentially having people come in and talk about it. Um, and so some of the questions on here, these are kindergarten questions again. What do snails eat? What are water bottles made of? Why do alligators have sharp teeth? So just lots of questions that they came from and they were able to answer all of the questions. Um, so this was kind of our creating that like, okay, let's start that curiosity because from there that's going to bring in some students with their voice and choice and their different um, wonderings that can hopefully be brought into a project-based learning uh, project. So at Meadowbrook, we're working with two different circles of um, elements of the teaching practices and design elements. So I'm gonna show you kind of those real, real quick. So this is our teaching practices and these are the design elements. And this year we focused on just three of these elements. We focus on aligning to standards. So what you're teaching, how, what is it going, how is it going to be meeting that second grade standard, that fourth grade standard? It can't just, we can do fun things, but it still needs to be meeting what the kids need to know for when they keep moving on throughout the school year. Um, we're also focusing this year on student voice and choice. So again, kind of bringing in the students in their learning and that's gonna help them stay engaged. That's gonna help them feel like they're a part of the classroom and take more risks when it's their ideas or their decisions and then bringing authenticity. So either the project is going to be a real life scenario, it's going to be using real tools or tasks that the students, that adults use to create something, or it's even bringing in experts to be interviewed, to be um, guider, uh, guiding because our teachers are not experts in everything. They're not experts in all areas of the world. There are other people that are that way. And so we can bring in people like that. And so I'll show you some examples of that as well. So this was an example of last year, a third grade classroom. Um, they job share Mr. Kelly, or Mr. Thorvalson and Mrs. Kelly, excuse me. And they started a taco truck project-based learning unit where the students had to create a, um, they had a budget and they had to design a food truck and figure out how many tacos they were gonna make and what ingredients were in it. And this year they've already expanded that to, they've brought in some, um, they brought in some more experts to it. And, but they're also, this was just a one classroom experience. This year there's expanding more to the third grade team because again, they started, we're starting slow to go smooth, to go fast. Um, but the students in this classroom, when I asked them, you know, what they had learned, they could just tell me all these things because they were engaged in it. They, was, they were choosing the ingredients, they were making their tacos, they're creating their taco names. They were figuring out the prices. And one student, I remember saying that they got a budget of $1,000 and they had three different truck ideas. And she said, yeah, once we bought our truck for $700, I only have $300 left. I, I went with a cheaper truck. <laughs> like she kind of was getting it like, oh, I, that was a, like, cause it was a really cool looking truck, 
but then it real she realized that she only had three hundred dollars left for her ingredients and everything else. So it's creating that um, that choice and versus the teachers giving them that. Um, and so as you see, uh, there's some different things that impact our students. The one thing that I really try to help teachers understand is that success skills and that exposure to adults and careers. Um, there are so many careers that are out there that are just, you know, I, I had no idea. And so bringing that into Meadowbrook and exposing that to our students is going to be so much more beneficial than if they read about it in a book. It's actually, they can hear someone and, and ask them questions and learn more. So this is this year's taco truck in third grade. And the third grade teachers invited chameleon concessions into their um, into their into the school and into their classrooms to talk about the taco trucks and food trucks that they make for people all over the world. Um, and they had two of the owners and then one man who also owns one of the trucks that they created. And the students were able to ask all these questions, and the students were able to see inside of a food truck just from pictures. But they've most of them have been to food trucks, but they've never seen inside. And so when they saw inside and they saw how tiny it was and the, you know, the little sink or the little workstation, it was very mind blowing to them, which in my eyes was like, yay, they're seeing something new and they're learning something new. Um, and so this is really bringing that authenticity into the classroom. Again, these third grade teachers and myself, we could do as much research as we wanted about food trucks and how they're made and how they're built, but we wouldn't know as much as these people who actually make them every single day and make them for ice cream to catering to festivals and all that. So the students were able to, um, this was kind of a kickoff to their food truck unit that they're gonna be creating this next month and a half. Um, and it was just really, it was, it was great to have them in here. And you can see this one student in the second, in this far picture, she's, they're showing this double decker bus food truck that they made and you can just see off her face she's just like oh, I can't believe that's actually something that someone made mm -hmm. um so again just exposing our students to that is is our goal so we have a first grade teacher who is um very uh very very excited about project-based learning which is very exciting to me and I always feel like I'm kind of bombarding him with different ideas or wanting him to do more but he and his first graders created an arcade game in their classroom, and it was based off of math standards, science standards, um, and just the ideas of cause and effect and collaboration. And so these are some examples of the students that have, they created their arcade games with parent help, with experts coming in, and then they had um, kindergarten uh, classrooms come in and, and play with the arcade games. And so part of project-based learning is presenting your project out to the public. And this was their version of pr producing it to the public. And so a lot of people, when they hear project-based learning, they think of kind of it's a, a junior high or high school or upper elementary, but our first graders, our six and seven-year-olds are able to do these big things. And these arcade games were so detailed and so intricate and they worked so hard on them and they had to problem solve different, you know, if the ball went through one hole, how did it come back down the ramp? And um, so they were very proud of their work. And they also had, some of them had lights and sounds to it. That was kind of the unit. So they had different buzzers going off if it hit a certain part, part of their arcade game or they had lights going off. One kid had a rotating and there was, the theme was like space. One kid had a rotating alien face that you had to get a ball into its mouth. I tried over and over and I asked him if anyone had actually gotten it in and he's like yeah <laughs> I was like okay well it's not my it's not my day I can't I'll let someone else give it a try but they just the, the creativity from these first graders and because of this they're working with that independence as well and again everything was their choice like they made um they made a a, a flyer or like an invite and they wrote what was the expectations for when people came to visit. It was their ideas, it was their voice that came through. It wasn't this teacher who said, this is what we're gonna do. It all came from them. Um, and I think this is one of my last examples, but this was our fourth grade this year. 
And um, a teacher was working on, um, she was a long-term sub for Miss Mock and so Miss Linville took over and they did a national parks project where the students had to research a national park and then make a Google site on, um, from Meadowbrook. How would you get there? What would you see? Where would you stay? What would like what things you would do? And then different things about the national park. And we had um, a special guest, another expert come in from the state park, a, a state ranger. And he came in and did a Google meet with the students and talked about website design and what he does on the Minnesota website design or what Minnesota state park um, and what is expected on those kind of websites. So then the students were able to take that and they got some ideas of like, what are some values? What basically you're trying to uh, convince people to come to their park. And then as you can see here, he came and what, uh, he came and he was able to be there when they presented their websites to everyone. And some students came through and so he was able to see and ask some questions and um, there was kind of a lull at the beginning. So a lot of fourth grade kids, you know, were like, where is everyone? And I was like, I don't know, but they're gonna be here really soon. And then as you can see in the second picture, then they were just kind of bombarded with another fourth grade classroom. And there was a ton of kids in that space. And then after that, more students came but they were very proud to show their work and the websites are wonderful. And I've only made one Google site in my life and it was really difficult. <laughs> so for fourth graders to do it is a huge success. So, um, so while you're looking, this is the, again, things that happen when students engage in PBL and this is our things that we're hoping that they will do in the future. And so for this year, we have, gone faster to hopefully get a little more, um, just a little bit more ideas into our school. And so we're not just going slow anymore. We're, we're ramping up. We know how to do this now. We've worked, worked on this as teachers. And, um, but in the future, first grade is going to be uh, studying and learning about children around the world. And they have um, some contacts in Uganda and they are gonna learn about schools in Uganda and schools like, and then compare them to our school and compare life in Uganda compared to life here. And um, they also collect money. And then from there, when they collect the money, they can uh, either like buy goats or latrines or food. And it goes to, P to a school in Uganda. And they were able last year to ask them questions. And then Uganda students answered them. And then the Uganda students asked our Meadowbrook students questions you know, like what's your favorite sport and our Meadowbrook students are basketball, soccer, and then Uganda students were saying netball. Mm -hmm. And the teacher who was there was like, will you describe what netball is? And it's just kind of like soccer, basketball, tennis, like it's those sort of things. So it's fun to see the comparison between the two schools. Um, our second grade uh, teachers are going to be doing a changes over time project-based learning. So these pictures were kind of like, hmm, maybe we'll maybe be checking them out or borrowing them, but not clearly give them back before March 14th. <laughs> we would never keep them that long. Um, but our second graders are gonna be learning about different things that have happened in the past. And so hopefully kicking it off next week, you know, by showing what a VHS player is or um, a cassette or if something as simple, you know, like an old rotary phone, like those things that students that are just have no clue, but we're gonna be showing that to second graders. And then in talking about what inventions have happened in the past, what are now, and then what will be in the future. Um, our third grade students are hopefully also gonna be creating some tiny houses and hopefully bringing, um, we have a former teacher whose daughter made a tiny house in their backyard. So potentially bringing her in to be kind of an expert as well. Um, and the rest of our school is doing, I can't think of any more on the top of my brain, <laughs> but the rest of our school, Natalie and I are both working with um, making sure that that's how our students are learning. Because again, the traditional, you know, kind of that factory learning is not how I want my spicy two-year-old daughter coming into Meadowbrook. I want her, you know, to be sharing her voice and hearing and I want her teachers to hear her too. So we're hopefully putting that kind of in place right now. And so Natalie mentioned the big ask. And so the big ask is 
if there's anything, a passion, a hobby, your job that you feel like you could give time to be an expert um, and give an interview, be someone there for the final product to see the work, um, we would love to have your information and have your expertise at Meadowbrook and for however long you would like to give that to us as well. I mean, we'd be happy to have you in every single day and, you know, learn as much as we could from you. And also if you can give a, an hour, that'd be wonderful too. Um, but I can send out this link as well to Betsy and then she can send it out to everyone too. Um, if you're interested in volunteering at Meadowbrook through our project-based learning. So are there any questions? But like Mary, when you, the question gets asked, you would by repeating it into yes. the microphone that we offer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. What portion of their day, week, or whatever is geared to this, and does it tie in to the regular classes as well? Mm -hmm. So, ideally, this would be not an add-on. This would be the day. Um, our hope is that it's a more um, Cross content or cross content learning. So you're incorporating the reading, science, and social studies into a project based learning. So it's, oh, I didn't answer that. I didn't say the question again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so ideally, that's what it is. Right now, there's a little of, a little of like, we're going to do it the last hour of the day. And some people are also just doing it. That is, their reading time, that is their literacy time, because when the students are researching these different ideas and they're writing their proposals or their Google sites, that is the writing time as well. Yes. Did I answer both of your questions? Yep. Okay, good. That was my question. Okay. <laughs> yes. So my, my kids went to Meadowbrook from 95 to 2007, really back in the day, long time ago. And we have an urban legend in our neighborhood that I'm going to share with you because you're probably not old enough to know it. But back when the Institute was brand new, they had a, uh, we always told this, is that there was a guy who got on the Institute from Japan and Googled, where's the best grade school in the world? <laughs> and he brought his kids and moved to, have you ever heard that story? No. Well, this went around amongst us <laughs> yeah. the parents of the first and second and third graders. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to propagate it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but the other question is, is that how does this differ from a Waldo school? Okay, so I'm going to, the question is, you might want to read it. Just, okay. How does this differ from a Waldo school? And I know about this much about a Waldorf school, so. Yeah, and I, I'm not an expert on Waldorf or Montessori either, but what I understand about those approaches is that it they do take lead from students. So they're integrating, you know, student interest or um, student passions. We're definitely trying to get there um, as well. Um, our preschools use an approach called um, Reggio Emilia, um, which is really, um, I take the let the students kind of take the lead, ask the, those wonder questions, and as the teacher be the facilitator, like you know, finding the resources that would help answer students' questions. And we would love to get um, to a place where where that is ours too. Back to your question too about what part of the day too. Certainly in our kindergarten, first grade, second grade, we're also building foundational skills, right? Without those foundational skills, we can't research, we can't um, create. So um we're still trying to navigate what is where where is that balance for things that are really foundational to where can we aspire to go and and have um, a project-based focus um, but students will tell you that not only is it really exciting learning but when we ask them like so what did you learn from the taco truck project they're like well i learned all about him important things like compromising, or I learned about that I can't always get my way in the group. So those skills that um, are just as important as learning how to add or um, the value of money, um, they're, they're gaining those from the experience too, so. Yeah, just to add to Natalie's, that's the part of the 
not just academic skills, but they're learning 21st century skills, or as people call them, soft skills. And so those are definitely things that we want to incorporate too. We have one last question here. Okay. How do you see our children who are at a learning disadvantage? I can see kids who are already excited to learn from good learning environments just thriving on this. But what about the children who are shy or mm -hmm. you know Yes, absolutely, they do. Um, if there are students that are not, you know, if they're introverted or not so as extroverted, if they're shyer, um, the students, there's still time and there's lots of strengths that they can bring to any unit. Um, as Natalie said, there's lots of collaboration too. So there's lots of group time, there's group work. Um, it isn't also just a free for all, like, okay, just go. There's still direct instruction from the teacher. There's still teacher supporting and scaffolding the learning as well. Um, and so when those, and also that goes back to this, that, that student is, is not where they are, you know, they're not where they need to be, or they're a little bit lower. They're still getting that time to share with the class, their voice. And that's going to give them some empowerment um, because they're engaged in their learning now. It's not just, well, here's a worksheet or here's a packet. They get to work with their classmates. They get to work with their teacher and they get to work with them together. Anything else to? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, when you give kids choice about what they might want to explore or how they're going to complete this project, um, it might be that they want to stand up in front of this in front of the class and share their project, or they might just want to share with one other person. And so um, try to take learning styles, but also um, or and provide choice, but also, um, you know, the idea about increasing engagement of students, right? So if we break away from the methods that we use that weren't serving all students and try new methods, we believe that by increasing engagement, we'll see different results. So regardless of where a family comes from or their experience with school or formalized learning um, you know, before kindergarten, um, we hope that just by providing you know, really high engagement situa learning situations that they'll feel connected to the learning. Well, thank you very much.